here with my colleague, um, who is going, who's from, uh, well, let me let him introduce himself. Would you introduce yourself? I'm Harish Sharma. I work with the International Water Management Institute as a principal researcher. On this project, I am leading the NIAE 2 Marine Water Management Systems project. I have been working with the CPWF for a quite number of years, right from its inception, uh, led a number of projects on water governance in Asia, the BFDIGB, or this NIAE Basin, also involved in the English Basin government projects. Okay, so uh, thank you for joining us. Um, let me ask you one or two questions uh, around the concept of integrated watershed management. So, firstly, can you tell us what you understand by the concept of integrated watershed management? The way this particular concept developed globally and especially in South Asia or Indian context, we can say that. Initially, it was just the soil and water conservation, the most technical way we have been just constructing barns, gullies, or terraces and other kind of things. But there was a little acceptance or there was a little, uh, you can say, overall the kind of acceptance or scaling out of these kind of perceptions or this kind of program. It was thought that unless you make it a comprehensive concept, you involve the communities, you involve the institutions, you involve all the components and job, not just water and crops, the concept is not like to work. So in India and especially in this part, over the last 40 or 50 years, the concept has developed just from soil and water conservation to integrated water, watershed management or water resources. Okay, so can just to bring this into reality, can you just mention one or two of the successful cases of integrated watershed management that you have been involved with? The first case, which is generally considered the golden story or the temple of watershed management in that part of the world, was started by David Seckler, the first director general of IMI. The project is called Sukhomaji Project. At that time, it was uh, part of the Rockefeller Foundation which founded that. The, all the concepts which we see today over here that how to involve communities, how to involve institutions, how to take the full ecosystem and full landscape into view, that was the first, you can say, living laboratory which is still cited. The, that particular site has produced more than 20 PhD theses, several reports, and more number of visitors, even to the Indian pilgrimage, might be lesser than the, the soil and water conservation practitioners or what should many practitioners they have been visiting that site. But then there were several other uh, similar successful experiments like Raleigh Gaon City in Maharashtra where uh, Mr. Anna Hajare who has been in the news for different regions uh, these days but there have been several other kind of uh, major projects where these kind of ideas developed by the civil society, developed by the governments, developed by the institutions they have been tested and they are now considered the real success stories. So what would you say were some of the key factors which led to success? The, one of the most turning point in the success of this watershed management was that we just shed away with our very narrow concept that water is just for crops and we have to just tap water. Unless we see that all the uh, arts of the society, whether they are landless, whether they, are, they have land, whether they are pastoralists, whether those kind of, all those who have stake in that kind of the particular landscape, if they are involved, and involved in a very thorough manner, and the entire process of this implementation, it becomes very bottom up, it becomes very transparent, and then you can say this, uh, uh, the total concepts takes over. One of the very recent things, one of the very kind of a landmark thing which happened about 15 years back in India, that government established this watershed development societies or institutions at small village level. And all the funds from the central government, from the state government, from the donor agencies, from everything, used to go directly to that kind of an institution. And it was made mandatory that not only the government officers, but 
the village chief or any representative from the village will also be a signatory to issuing of the checks for issuing of the contracts. So no contract or no payment regarding the development of that watershed management can be made unless the community authorizes to make it. So that made the system entirely transparent. That was one kind of a major change. The second change which we think that the involvement of the civil society in that thing. We know that the capacities of the most governments to govern these kind of things are very limited. The innovations, they, they come from the civil society. They come from those people who are experiencing those difficulties day in and day out. So they developed models that the models which came from top down, the governments that how they thought, they did they, they, this whatsoever you are suggesting is less likely to work or it has got certain inadequacies, inefficiencies and if you evolve your model, if you develop that model in a more comprehensive way, the way society feels it. So then there was a little coming down from the top down, there was also very good suggestions from the bottom up and we found a merging ground which that particular model that, that really has started working and that has really started giving good results. So it sounds like a lot of this is about community empowerment and uh, bringing voices from the communities, uh, holding the authorities accountable to the communities in the development process. Yeah, that's a, to a very large extent. This is what the, the most innovative models or most uh, the models which we see that uh, how the community's involvement, how the transparency in the system, how the sustainability of the systems, how these things they progress, they, they really are progressing in such a way that when the voices of the people, those, those are at the bottom of the pyramid, they are heard, they are taken, the growth becomes inclusive, the, those kind of issues they, they, they can happen. Otherwise you can say most of the governments or most of the institutions, they try to do things which are fantastic, which make an impact. It's very easy to, for a government to have a leverage by inaugurating a dam. You can see a chief minister putting a button and the water gushes out. But when you make even hundreds or even thousands of 3 meter cube or 10 meter cube of small ponds, nobody notices. So the, the critical mileage which, which government generally was getting by making those large dams, those kind of things. So though, though I have to talk that those things are important, but still there are about 70% of the population, there is about 70% of the people rural living in the area, their voices need to be heard and the programs need to be suitable, made in such a way that you can say that they are both scientific, that they create to the livelihoods, that they develop sustainable institutions and they improve the overall livelihoods of those people. So can some of those processes be translated into recipes which could be applied elsewhere? Several of those models, you can say, uh, they have been tried um, over here and uh, one of the, you can say, they have spread to several of the neighboring countries. Even this particular project or uh, you can say, at EMU we started a very small project in the beginning which was called South-South Collaboration. Before joining this project, we, I already visited Ethiopia where this EIAR and other can say, and we invited them to visit India, several, about 10 or 12 of those uh, watershed, successful watershed development projects. And I visited, you can say, several of those projects then, and then not only me, but several of our, all of those institutions, they were brought together. Even recently, our uh, SLM leader, Dr. Darian Donano, he had been visiting India and other kind of things. There are, people find that there are very good elements of these success stories which can be from a developing country can be uh, still transferred to a country which is at If I visualize South Asia or India, we were um, almost comparable or little higher than at the stage at which Ethiopia is today, about 40 or 50 years back. But the communities are similar, the constraints are similar, the governments or the institutions or the, those kind of things, they are quite comparable. We have similar kind of things, means uh, the kind of um, lethargy or the kind of uh, inefficiencies or the kind of uh, uh, less uh, uh, understanding of the voices or the concerns of the communities. But then you can say once those uh, models they became uh, suitable, they became understandable, you can say there are very good things you can say. And uh, um, I'll just take one more minute that my recent uh, visits 
to all these three or four sites where we spent about uh, more than around two weeks. Oh, and when you interact with those communities, the concerns are quite similar. They just want similar those things which are happening elsewhere. And uh, I think uh, this particular project, the NBDC as a whole, and this this is a real good platform. Otherwise, in the national systems or other kind of systems, we find very few projects who are that kind of interdisciplinary who have those all those components built into one project and showcase them that this is a model. We cannot transform whole of Ethiopia, we cannot transform whole of Africa, but at least if we can transform those three Oredas or three even working sites, if we can see, tell at the end of a project, yes, this is a working model where you have biophysical, where you have institutional, where you have social, where you have livelihood and all other components. And the process is entirely net over the uh, three or four years. Now it's up to the government. It's, you can say when you invite them, they are already partners. I think there shall be a very good opportunity to transform the ongoing projects and start the new projects in the same way in which these models they will be able to tell. So let me bring you back again to the, the differences or similarities between Ethiopia and India. Do you see any contextual differences which would make it, which would need to be overcome in order to apply some of this, uh, these processes in Ethiopia? Uh, I think I'll try to be a bit candid on this one. One uh, particular difference which I find in the societies in South Asia and especially India where I have little more experience and in uh, Africa is the voice of the civil society. It, it is rather mute here in this part of the world which is really very strong over there. In uh, most of the South Asia, the civil society, they, they can, you can say, force the governments. They can ask the governments that this is what we want and the rules should be, the policies should be, the frameworks, the investments, they should come this way. If you are not going to do this, we are not allowing to work on this. I say. There can be real means a kind of a confrontation uh, which uh, somehow late uh, Mahatma Gandhi taught to the Indian population, but uh, th that has become a real tool that uh, this is what the society wants. And that kind of voices, uh, I think, uh, are rather mute or uh, they are not that effective or that you can say. That particular thing, if uh, really can work from the bottom, that's... The second thing is about the innovations or the institutions. Here also, uh, what I witnessed over the years, there are, you can say, even in the dark spots, there are really very bright spots. They are, they are small, but they are, you can say, very intelligent very innovative, with great potential of scaling out or you can say scaling up. Those things, they need to be tapped, they need to be brought up and we need to just work with the situation with which we are. We cannot change the political systems, we cannot change those things and that's not within our mind mandate to do. What we need to do, a good science, a good demonstrable science which can be shown or with which people can be convinced that this, this is really what we do and I think that this is a, the ground is right, the concerns of the government, whether it is here, whether it is there, they are the same. Everybody wants to be welfare, everybody wants to do this thing, but if we really have good models we, which people can adopt, we, which are not just from our scratch of mind that we think that this is going to work, this should work, it's not like that. It has to work, people has to accept. Okay, so just for my final question, um, we're gathered here as the MBDC community. What do you think the implications of some of this thinking are for these projects and what are the mechanisms by which we can learn from the Indian experience? Um, since uh, given this opportunity, um, uh, that uh, one of the reasons that uh, I was given this opportunity to, to lead this N2 project, which is a kind of a little larger project over there, to, to bring and translate those Indian experiences over here, whether these are biophysical, whether they are institutional, whether they are policy and other kind of things. So I'm trying to do that thing, but there are several other channels as well. We'll try to bring the National Ring Fed Area Authority from India, 
those persons we have already in touch but there are several good local examples as well there are several good local um, programs and projects uh, right over here which can be brought over there um, we means uh, with such a uh, beautiful with such a integrated and cohesive group with all those kind of knowledges still available but only thing is that we are right at the stage of this takeoff but if we steer in that particular direction with that purpose in mind that uh, we have to uh, bring at the end a really adoptable models adoptable strategies and uh, implementable feasible policies at the end of uh, 2014 or something so i think uh, i have full confidence that we can deliver and make a difference dr Bharat sharma thank you for sitting in the hard seat <laughs> thank you